Okay, um, so our next presenter is Margot Jordan. She is an event planner. She has worked on events internationally, including music festivals, um, trade shows, and everything else. So I am going to share her pre-recorded session on my computer, and then we will invite her back for Q&A afterwards. Everyone. I am super excited to be speaking to you guys today about finding your niche. Um, first, I guess you want to know why I'm qualified to even speak on that subject. Um, so I'll start with telling you a little bit about myself. I am a corporate event planner and I have been for almost 20 years. I currently work for Align Technology, which are the makers of Invisalign, if any of you are familiar. Um, I have planned across many other industries across my career, both within the U.S. and internationally. I've worked in nonprofit, I've worked in the race car industry, if you can believe it, I've done all kinds of different things. But what I also do is have my own events planning company, um, M Jordan Events. I'm the owner of that and I freelance um, events for um, different companies as well. I do some emotional type events. Um, I do, um, I'm able to collaborate with friends that um, are personal interest to me. I've done festivals, all kinds of different things. So in my day, by day, I'm a corporate event planner working for someone else. And um, at night and on the weekends, I um, work for myself and I'm able to be a little bit more selective in the type of events I've planned. So it's safe to say that I'm a person who's found their niche since I do it personally and professionally. Um, but before I can help you find yours, I'm gonna help you understand a little bit more about what is a niche. So the, diff the dictionary example um, is pretty straightforward. Basically your specialty or your comfort zone. If you've ever heard um, anybody say, stay in your lane, your niche is kind of like your lane. I really like to call it the sweet spot. Why is it important to find your niche? Well, that's what I'm here for today to help you to talk to you about. So I like to start with how to find it before I tell you why it's important to find me. Trust me, I got this. I'm gonna tell you all about what it is first and then I'll tell you why it's important to find it. Um, to find your sweet spot, you really have to answer three important questions. The first one is, what am I good at? Um, that's more what you have like a natural aptitude for, like you may be good at math, you may be a creative person, you might be handy around the house or really good at building things, or you might be musically inclined. You might be able to sing, play an instrument, things like that. Some people are amazing at baking. Some are just naturally good at computers. My grandma used to tell me I was so good at trying to convince um, people to do what I wanted them to do that I should be a lawyer. The same way my son was really good at Legos and I used to say, you're probably gonna end up being an engineer. Neither one of us are either of those things, <laughs> but that's number one. If you're taking notes, write that down. What are you good at is the first question you need to ask yourself. The next question is, what do I enjoy doing? Um, that's basically plain and simple. What is it that you find joy doing? What do you spend your free time doing? What is your passion? What um, kind of hobbies might you have? Those type of things. That's, that answers the question of what do you enjoy doing? So that's question number two. The last question is, am I gonna get paid for this? <laughs> Does it generate income? Um, is it something that somebody's gonna pay me to do it or am I gonna make some money in some kind of way doing it? So those are the questions. What am I good at doing? What do I enjoy doing? And can I get paid to do it? Now what? Well, now you have to combine all three. Um, and the key is in analyzing all of those things together. And I'm um, a little nerdy in my free time too, so I created this Venn diagram. I love diagrams. So if you're not familiar with Venn diagrams, Venn diagrams are uh, an illustration that uses circles to show the relationships between things. Um, um, and different intersections of those circles mean different things or can predict different outcomes. So as you can see here, 
in what you enjoy doing is at the top circle. What you're good at doing is over here in the blue circle. Generate income or can I get paid for it is over here in the purple circle. Um, you can see that there's all sorts of overlaps. There's you can enjoy doing something and make money doing it. You can enjoy doing something and be good at doing it. You can be good at doing something and make money doing it. Um, and like I said, those different intersections may mean different things. Like if you just enjoy doing something and you can make money doing it, but you're not that good at doing it, you're probably not gonna make that much money doing it. If you enjoy doing something and you're good at doing something, but you can't make money from it, that's pretty much a hobby. So there's, there's lots of, like I said, lots of different ways that these intersect. But what is the sweet spot? The sweet spot is this little part right there in the middle, um, right there. That's the sweet spot. That is the intersection of all three of these things. You're good at it, you enjoy doing it, and you can make money doing it. Why is it important to find that sweet spot, that best of all worlds? Well, in order to answer that, I feel like it's important to go back to our definition of what a niche is. So the first definition in here in red is a comfortable or suitable position in life or employment. That means you're happy, you're fulfilled, you're probably good at it, and you enjoy doing it. Um, and one of my favorite quotes describes this the best. Find a job that you enjoy doing and you'll never have to work a day in your life. I love this quote. If you Google this quote, you're going to get all kinds of um, answers for who said it. So I put them all on here. Some say Confucius said it, Mark Twain, it was in a Mark Anthony song. I'm just going to go with unknown. A bunch of people said it because it's a really good quote. It means you're motivated by being fulfilled. It means money's not really your motivator or you just really enjoy what you're doing. Think of it as if you just have a really crappy day at work and you're doing something, you know, you're doing something that um, is just very tedious or is a very pretty day outside and you don't really want to be at work, if you really enjoy what you're doing, it's actually not that bad. You know, you can you can get through a lot of things. Every all jobs are stressful. You can get through stress at some point. I would say, you can get through that stress a little bit better if it's something that you really enjoy doing. So it doesn't really feel like work. Now let's go back to the definition because there was a second one. The second part of that definition is a specialized segment of the market for a particular kind of product or service. That, um, there's a quote for this too. Niches make riches. What does that mean? It means that people will pay for a specialty skill set. This typically means that this is something that, if we go back to that definition, sorry, um, it's a specialized segment of the market for a particular kind of product or service. That means that your niche is something that is not oversaturated in the market. It's something that um, you, if you think of it as like grocery stores, you can go to a general grocery store, you can go to a health food grocery store, you can go to a grocery store that has a really good um, meat section. <laughs> like there's, there's niches in everyday life, there's niches everywhere. So if you think of it that way, um, you might be the subject matter expert on in some field. You might be, for instance, myself, for example, in the event planning world, you might be a general event planner that you just say, hey, anything you need, I can do it. Or you might be a wedding planner, or you might be a destination wedding planner, or you might be in the travel part of the industry where, you know, you just are, you know, you just do travel related events, all different things like that. Or if you think about it like a singer, you might be a uh, opera singer, or uh, you might be a rapper, or you might be a pop singer, you can, you know, all different things, and people gravitate toward you based on their interest or your specialty or your niche. So, like I said, niches make riches. Um, and that's, sorry, back one slide. Bear with me here, recording myself. Um, there. Like I said, 
people pay for specialty. And that's where that saying comes from. Now I'm gonna tell you how. What is your path to finding your niche? Well, most start with what they're good at. What's your major um, that you, or you have some sort of aptitude in. Most start at one. Um, and income, as we know, is a necessity. So most people are looking for a job, um, like you guys may be when you graduate. Um, and if they, you may either start here, you're good at it, or you start with, I just need a job. I just need to generate some income. You're lucky if you enjoy your job. Um, so three typically comes in later. Some find their niche while they're doing what they're good at because they discover that they like something about their job or the industry that they're in or by seeing what someone else did. Um, for example, I'm going to take a minute to tell you my story and how I found my niche, which is what you all are here to hear. <laughs> so um, I was in high school and I thought I wanted to be an accountant. And it was because I enjoyed the order of it. I hate math but I enjoyed the order of accounting. I enjoyed that everything had a place, everything had a box, you know, all those different things that, you know, in accounting, there's checks and balances. Um, so I thought that that's what I wanted to go to school for. I graduated high school, went off, decided I was gonna be an accountant. As a part of that, while I was in high school, I'd also taken one of those tests or inventory questionnaires that you, you fill it all out and based on your personality or based on the answers to the question, it tells you what you should be when you grow up. Mine told me event planner. At the time, I had no idea it was a whole industry. In my head, it was party planning and I had no interest in doing that. I wanted to go make some money and I didn't think being a birthday party planner was that. Um, so off I go to be an accountant. I'm working at a job at, in the accounting department and a position comes open in travel and events. I didn't think to apply to it, but someone suggested, I think you'd be really good at this your, you know, or maybe just help out in that department and see if you like it. So off I went to do that. And as, as part of doing that, I took this role within the company where I had been an accountant, um, being a travel manager, and then slowly started doing, um, helping out with company events. In the midst of all that, light bulb went off, immediately remembered the inventory test that I'd taken in high school, because I really enjoyed doing it. And I was really good at it. And I was making money doing it. Had no idea what that meant at the time, but I found my sweet spot. Um, so that's kind of the roundabout way of how I got to mine and have been doing it ever since. I've been, I've been in the industry, like I said, that was 20 years ago. And I have, um, I worked my way up. I started as an event coordinator and learned a lot. I joined as many industry related um, associations as I could, I networked. I um, eventually ended up manage, managing a department. I worked across other different industries. I've done workshops, conferences, trade shows, you know, you name it. I've worked on festivals and on my freelance side uh, because, you know, when you do things for yourself, you're able to be a little bit more selective and do things that you're interested in. I have a huge interest in music. So I've worked on some music related events. I've managed stages. I, um, I tend to shy away personally from emotional events, so I don't do many weddings or things like that. But again, that's my choice. Um, so that's kind of how a, a, a snapshot of finding your niche. But honestly, there's no set path. Um, like, for instance, what if you don't find all three in your job? What if you're not lucky enough to, to get to do what you enjoy doing? You do what you're good at, and you generate income, but you find that you don't really enjoy it. Well, that's what side hustles are for, or hobbies are for, or working for yourself. Um, if you, um, a great example is Oprah. Oprah started out as a news anchor in 1976. She didn't start the Oprah show until 1986. That was 10 years of her doing something that she was good at, and very similar to what she ended up enjoying doing, but she didn't find her, her, her real niche that she, wanted to be a talk show host and have control over her content until 10 years later. So if you take one thing from today, actually, before I tell you that, I mean, I did put together a couple of examples of like the obvious sweet spot. So here's Mike when he's a kid and he enjoys cooking. Ever since he was a kid, he'd helped his grandma cook and um, 
um, Sunday dinner. Then while he was in high school, he started working for a local small restaurant, learning all he could from the owner and decides to go to culinary school after he graduates. So here's Mike, found his sweet spot early and continued on that path. Then he becomes really good at French cuisine. So he, he found his niche within his sweet spot. During, um, he did that while he was an emergency immersion opportunity in culinary school. And after graduation, he opened the only French restaurant in his hometown and has a three month waiting list for reservations. So for him, as you can see, people pay for his specialty of French cuisine within his niche that he found early on by being doing something that he loved doing. That's the obvious. That rarely happens, but it can happen. Um, but what more often happens is an alternate way of finding your sweet spot, similar to my story. So here's Teresa, who I also made up, but she's naturally good at math. Her family has always said that she would make a good accounting. So she goes off and gets a degree in accounting and finds a job in finance. She works her way up within an organization and is managing a department with growth plan of becoming the VP of finance. So she's doing very well at this because she's good at it. But as you can see, these paths that are indicated by the colors, they kind of blend in. They're not as cut and dried as, as like I said, Mike's was. His was boom, 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 one, two, three. Teresa's kind of blended. So she, she goes off and does what she's good at. She doesn't find fulfillment in her corporate America job, but she enjoys what she does. So there's a little bit of blend there. Like she's good at it, she enjoys it, but she doesn't like the fact that she's doing it in corporate. Like she, she wants a little bit more control over what she does and how she does it. So she like, but she likes the security of having her full-time job with benefits, like we all do. And, um, but she, in order to find that fulfillment that she's missing by still doing what she loves, she volunteers her time doing taxes for people who can't afford a CPA. Eventually she saves up for 10 years and opens her own financial planning business where she can be a little bit more selective over her clients. She can do, she can do some pro bono work if she wants to, but she's kind of found her sweet spot. But while she was still working for someone else, she was still doing what she loved. So she had some type of fulfillment. So that's kind of where I'm going with finding your niche. Figure out what it is that you like to do. But again, everybody's path is different. Everybody doesn't know what it is. I actually think it's, it's um, really interesting that um, we expect people to know what they want to do when they graduate high school and then they go off to college for four years to learn about it. And, and as a result, which is why I know several people who have degrees in anthropology and are working in finance or working in something else or doing something completely different, such as me with my accounting background as an event planner. So that leads me to my final thought. All of this really, if you take any, nothing else from today, what I want you to take away from today is do what you love and love what you do. That's the most important thing. That's my wish for all of you, that you find your passion and you make lots of money or you find lots of fulfillment doing it, whichever one is your motivator. Um, so that is it. We are gonna leave time for Q and A. So before we do that, I do wanna give you guys my contact information. Um, I This is my corporate, um, my freelance agency, um, M. Jordan Events. You feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me at my email at margo at mjordanevents.com, on my website at mjordanevents.com, or um, hopefully if you have questions, we can also connect during the Q&A today. But it's been a pleasure um, sharing how I found, found my niche and how you guys can start to figure out what you guys is. is. Thank you and have a good day. Okay. Thank you so much, Margo. Good morning. Um, it's good to see you. You as well. Good morning. Um, so a couple questions in the chat. Um, can you talk about creating your own niche and like any advice that you have for students that are trying to do that? 
Um, uh, I think what I would say is, it's really important to understand what it is that you're passionate about um, and creating your niche within um, whatever that is. Like I said, it could be within any industry. There's, um, is, is finding what it is that you're really good at within maybe a bigger thing that you're doing. Like I said, you may be the subject matter expert, like within accounting, you may be good at taxes or you may be really good at, um, at um, the, the finance, financial advising part of it. Um, or like, like I said, with an event planning, I know that weddings are not my thing. I don't like emotional events. I don't like events that are like really like, it's just not me. I prefer corporate events. I prefer, um, I prefer bigger box type events like special events or festivals or um, things that are, that are related to like a brand launch all kinds of things like that. Like weddings just aren't my thing and I don't enjoy doing them. So if I have a choice, I choose not to, but it also goes back to, if I don't really enjoy doing it, I'm probably not gonna do it that well. So I'm probably not gonna get many clients or make much money from it. And in, in doing that, I'm gonna ruin my overarching brand. So, um, so finding out like what it is that I'm really good at and sticking to that. And like I said, staying in your lane is a very good way to put it. Um, and as, as a part of being um, in a bigger um, area like that, sometimes what you find is that people come to you with all kinds of other asks and that might not be what you do. And you refer them to the specialist um, and that goes with staying in your list. That's how you become um, known as that subject matter expert or that the, the um, person that has the knowledge in that particular area and you're really good at that. And you, that's how you build up your client base and people start to refer people to you as the expert in that area. And that's kind of how you, you find your niche and kind of build, build your audience for that niche. Awesome, thank you. So can you talk about some of your most favorite events that you've done, kind of staying in your lane and working in your niche? Yeah, absolutely. So um, on the corporate side, I would say I was working for a large nonprofit and I actually got to go to Africa and I worked on an event that brought together all of the heads of um, all of the Ministry of Health from different African countries together in one event. And we were presenting on one particular tropical disease and how to tackle it. But um, I learned a whole lot about, um, and that's where I learned a lot about international events and all the protocols that you have to do. Um, the protocols involved in having different um, dignitaries from other countries um, involved is, is huge there. I also, um, working for the same company, did an event where royalty was present and all the things that you have to know when someone, and the interesting thing about that is she was like 21st in line for the throne. So never would have been like a queen or something, but the fact that she was from the royal bloodline, the things that I had to do to prepare for her to be at my event were, you know, it was ridiculous. Like she couldn't ride in an elevator with anybody else and all this other stuff. So um, I think when I learned something new, is is when I'm happy because you know like I said I've been doing this for 20 years so there's rarely like I can do this in my sleep so when I get the opportunity to learn something new it really challenges me and I enjoy that um, the perfect example of that is this year um, imagine being an event planner in the middle of a pandemic with everything being live and all of a sudden you either do nothing or you figure it out so I pivoted to virtual um, and I I've you know, as a creative, I live in the right side of my brain. And this year I've lived in the left side of my brain a, a lot. <laughs> and so I really have um, appreciated the opportunity and uh, to have a new skill set after, you know, you know, getting old. <laughs> You're not getting old. <laughs> um, but what are some I guess, tips or skills that you would recommend students who are interested in event planning look into while they're, you know, pursuing that path at Central? Um, I, you know, what's interesting is um, the skill set 
that made me think that I wanted to be an accountant is the skill set needed to be an event planner. It just uses a different part of your brain. So like I said, the order of it and the detail, you really have to have a lot of attention to detail. Um, you have to be extremely organized. Um, you have to be able to um, manage multiple competing priorities um, and still look like you're not falling apart. I think my best analogy of an event planner is a duck. <laughs> like on the surface, you're really calm and, and everyone thinks everything's good, but under the water, your legs are just flapping and flapping and flapping and nobody knows. <laughs> so um, just, um, I would say, and it, it also requires some level of technical skill set um, because you, or an ability to work well across all levels of leadership. So I would um, work on, you know, communication skills um, because you, you're frequently writing materials, you're frequently communicating with lots of different people at all levels. Um, definitely attention to detail and organization um, are, are come into play there. Awesome. Well, if um, anyone has any last minute questions, we have a few more minutes um, of this session. Definitely curious um, if there's just any last minute advice that you might have for students, Margot. I would just say, um, figure out what it is that you love. I, I always go back to that, do what you love and love what you do. I preach it to anybody who will listen because it really does make a difference. It's the difference between a job and a career. Um, and sometimes when you first graduate college or when you first are starting out in your career, I would say that um, you have a job. <laughs> you just wanna make money. You wanna, you're, you're entry level usually. I mean, that's where you, where you discover if you really like what it is you thought you were gonna like. Like I said, I don't believe anyone knows what they wanna do for the rest of their life when they're in high school. Um, I'm way out of high school and sometimes I wonder what I want to be when I grow up still like it was you know you just you, you you should always challenge that and if you don't like it it's okay to change like I said I know plenty of people who are not doing anything near what their major is I know people who are um who start off in college and by the time they're a senior they're doing something different than what they thought they wanted to do because you're learning and you're growing um and if you get into an organization or your entry level job is in a larger company, take all of those opportunities to cross train. Um, if they offer internships in other departments like some companies do, or they offer you the opportunity to work on larger projects that are just not within your department or your skill set, take those opportunities because that's when you get exposure to other things. And then you're able to um, broaden your horizons and, and experience other things and learn um, if you know, there's something else that you didn't even realize that you had an aptitude for. And, um, and then if you find that there's something that you're really passionate about, but you can't branch out at the time, because like I said, everybody's path is different. Everybody doesn't have that opportunity. Um, then go and do it um, on the side, go volunteer at some organizations that are parts, you know, in those areas that you feel like are, um, are your passion, because that's also a way to experience it without any real commitment or, you know, you don't really lose anything except some volunteer hours. I love it. Um, so what are some of your upcoming opportunities and are they open for students to attend? Right now, everything is pretty much not happening. <laughs> like on the freelance side, a lot of, um, a lot of things are on hold or waiting to see when they'll come back live. But definitely connect with me and on my website i'll def i'll post things there and um my social media i'm m jordan events on social media professionally and margo sunshine personally um you're welcome to follow me and um, usually i post about what's coming up um, on any freelance projects or anything that you can get involved in that i'm working on great well thank you so much margo it was a pleasure seeing your face this morning um, and I'm hoping that the students took as much from your presentation that I did. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye.